to go back to 48 because of the new. <laughs> World War II, the greatest generation, hundreds and thousands of people fought that war. They came back. And the federal government said, we will honor your service. And on your behalf, we will build the middle class. And we know one of the greatest ways to build the economic power of a family is to help them with home ownership. So there was a federal push with resources focused on that greatest generation to help them buy homes. And guess who was excluded? Our black service. So then, what are we talking about? When there was an infusion of resources for some, there was nothing for others, contributing them to what had already been existing as a disparity based on institutionalized racism and, of course, years of slavery. Then, fast forward to the decades of redlining, where black families were excluded from buying homes in communities which would see great appreciation of the value of those homes. Then you add on it, and Nevada knows this more than most, the foreclosure crisis, which came about, let's remember, because those banks had been targeting predatory loans in our community and so many others. And then we experienced foreclosure at a rate disproportionate to most other communities. So where does that leave us? That leaves us not having the kind of economic power that families need to generate intergenerational wealth. Common, what are you talking about? Okay, here's what I'm talking about. Intergenerational wealth. So let's say the father, the son goes to the father and says, Daddy, I want to go to Howard University. Check his butt. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go to Howard University. And the father says, son, you don't need to go out and take a loan from one of those predatory private lenders. I'll take some equity out of the house and help you with tuition. Or maybe the daughter says, Mama, I would like to start a small business. And the mother says, Honey, you don't have to take out a loan. I'll take some equity out of the house to help you start that small business. Intergenerational wealth. What do we do to create healthy communities? It's about economic empowerment. It's about what we need to do in our public schools. Recognizing that we need a robust public education system, but since Brown v. Board of Education, I benefited from it, so many did. I was bused to school, y'all know about that now. <laughs> well, also, let's be truth. After Brown v. Board of Education, certain families started moving their kids out of the public schools. And with that went the resources. And so we are looking in America today at probably equal, if not greater, segregation in our public schools based on race and based on economic situation. So healthy communities. Well, we achieve healthy communities by also investing in public education. That means starting with investing in our teachers. The first policy I rolled out as a candidate for president had to do with the need to close the teacher pay gap in America here in Nevada, it's $15,000 a year. I will put in place the first federal investment we've had ever in closing that teacher pay gap. Healthy communities. We pay attention to issues like public health and the need to have the resources in the community that are about the clinics, that are about the hospitals, that are about the specialists who can aid when we know our communities have for our babies some of the highest rates of asthma, that we still are so burdened with so many who have diabetes, but one in four cannot afford their insulin. Let's deal with the fact that black maternal mortality is an issue in America where a black woman is three to four times more likely to die in connection with childbirth than other women. So I have a Medicare for All plan that says we're gonna have everybody covered. We're gonna bring down costs. We're going to hold those insurance companies responsible by saying we're going to get rid of co-pays and deductibles, but also a point of distinction between me and some of the other people on the debate stage. I heard from folks, I'm not trying to get rid of private insurance. I'm going to leave you with the choice that you need to make about one of those personal decisions in your life, which is your health care. Healthy communities. Well, we've had all this conversation about public health. You know what we have not been talking about? 
We talk about public health as though the body starts from the neck down. Let's talk about it from the neck up and talk about what we need in terms of mental health. Because I may not be walking around with a limp and a cast, but I need a little help. I think I'm running for president. I probably do. <laughs> but we need to recognize that when we look at issues like childhood trauma, Babies who are being raised in communities where they hear gunfire every night. Children who are being raised in poverty. Because let's be clear, poverty is trauma-inducing. And what are we doing then to build healthy communities around things like early detection and treatment of childhood trauma? And I could go on and on. The clock is ticking, so I'm going to bring it to a close. But I will say this. I believe in this presidential race that there is so much at stake and justice is on the ballot in 2020. Be it health care justice, criminal justice, I could go on and on about what we need to do to address that. Economic justice, educational justice, all these issues are on the table. And what we need on that debate stage as the nominee is somebody who has the ability to go toe to toe with Donald Trump, and I believe you're looking at her. And we need someone who has the ability to speak truth about these issues based on a long standing, not only commitment, but experience of understanding what is involved and what needs to be done. Thank you. A lot of the focus on affordable housing relates to availability of affordable land. In North Las Vegas, the community that I represent, and many of the surrounding communities have been impacted by the lack of available infill development and available land in predominantly black neighborhoods. What can be done to make sure new affordable housing projects are developed in a way that serves those in urban areas and not the suburbs and the outlying areas? So my whole economic agenda that includes, and I have a specific agenda that is what that we have named our black agenda, please visit, because I can only get into so much detail in time we have, um, but on our website. But on the issue of affordable housing, it's, it's a very real issue. So a couple things. One, um, we know that black families have one-tenth of the wealth of other families. And when you're looking at home ownership, the numbers are something like black families, I think, about 40% of home ownership versus 77% of other families. So it's a very real issue. Um, also the issue of affordable housing being rent. So part of my plan is that for anybody who's paying more than 30% of their income in rent plus utilities, you'll receive a tax credit. Because one of the, the byproducts of a lack of affordable housing is homelessness. And so we want to obviously do what we need to do to prevent that from happening. In terms of affordable housing, I have a multi-billion dollar plan that's about investing in community, but doing it in a way that's about investing in affordable housing that includes dealing, bringing in our brothers and sisters from labor, the building trades, to help with the apprenticeship programs, to build the skills of the community so community members can participate in actually building the affordable housing. Because this has to go hand in hand if we really want to have lasting economic impact on the community. In addition, unlike Donald Trump, my plan is not about trying to put money in the back pockets of developers. It's about putting the money in the community. Because, you know, he's had all these opportunities on kind of things. And that's been all about rich people making a whole lot of money, saying they're going to help our community, but really they're just helping themselves. So the details do matter, and um, these are some of the details I'm offering. Hi, so I'm a single woman, Dina Neal, and so I'm really glad that you brought up the historical disparities. Um, my question is, African American employment is still twice as high as the general public, and nearly 20% of black youth are either not working or not in school. So what federal policies can be put in place to train and provide a skill set to local black workforce 
for future careers in, in emerging technology like AI. Yes. So um, well, a big area of focus for me on education um, is focusing on our HBCUs. I'm a proud graduate of Howard University. Um, I do know that when we think about, you know, you said AI, STEM, science, technology, and really to STEAM, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. Um, that our HBCUs have been a great pipeline provider um, to get, get into those fields. Mm -hmm. And so there's a big part of my plan that is about investment in our HBCUs, including investing in our um, in our students so that they will not be burdened with, with the student loan debt. 85% of black college students come out with an exorbitant amount of debt, um, which then prevents them from entering some of the fields for which they have a passion because they just can't afford to live. Um, Another piece of this is about what we need to do to transition people into the jobs of the 21st century. Over the next 15 years, up to 40% of the jobs that currently exist will not exist. And we need to deal with that. So part of my plan of action is that for folks who need to transition to, to acquire new skills for the jobs that need to be filled, they'll get an $8,000 tax credit. That can be applied to the cost of the training, including the cost of childcare and transportation to take on the training. Because we need to give people the support to actually transition into those jobs. In addition, it is my strong belief that we've got to re, we have to reconfigure how we've been thinking about education in America. Now certainly I can talk extensively about what that means K through 12. But I'm gonna talk about what that means in terms of how we talk about higher education. We talk about higher education and make it sound like that we talk about college. And we have, as a society, placed a certain value on the job that requires a college education to the point that we have devalued the jobs that don't require a college education but still require a lot of skill and, and provide a great value. So I've, I've started to talk about it as what we need to focus on in terms of being better in, in providing education after high school. And then we can talk about the tracks, right? And there are going to be various tracks. For some, that will be college. And we never want to discourage our kids from going to college. Um, but for some, it will be education after high school that helps them get the certificate that is necessary to take the job, right? And, and understanding each one of these tracks and the jobs that they will produce are going to provide great value. So that's how I think about it overall. Uh, thank you again for being here, Senator Harris. Great to see you again. Um, you, you talked about uh, community health and generational wealth. Uh, you talked about education. And you ended your, your comments indicating that justice is on the ballot. Um, last April, April 28th, when I was a candidate, you and I sat at the table together and you talked about my candidacy for Attorney General. Um, and you don't know this, but I have a hashtag in my office now, and it is our job is justice. Um, and that's based on our conversation. My, my question to you is, is uh, there are so many overlapping uh, and interrelated issues that affect intergener intergenerational wealth yeah. and community health, criminal justice being one of them. Yes. Uh, can you speak to us about the criminal justice reform package and your vision on that? Yes. So, you know, I'm a child of parents who are after the civil rights movement. Um, I grew up you know, knowing the inequities and injustice in the criminal justice system. And I guess I decided to go up the rough side of the mountain, but I decided, well, to reform the system, let's let's also take take on roles that are inside the system where you can be at the table where the decisions are being made. So I made a decision to become a prosecutor, um, knowing also that you know my my desire and, 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 and passion to reform the system. I, you know I also know I'm not so good asking permission. So I decided, well, let me go in where I can actually make the decisions. And so the decisions included when I was elected district attorney in San Francisco, I was elected as the first black woman to be district attorney in any county in the state of 40 million people. And I started a, a national, it became a national model. In fact, the holder of the Obama Justice Department designated my work as a model of innovation for the United States. It included creating one of the first in the nation programs for young men in particular who were arrested for drugs and giving them jobs. I partnered with building trades, I partnered with our faith-based community, and it became a model. And you can imagine, this was back in the old days. This was, I was elected in 2003. So this was before, thankfully, we've seen the kind of progress on criminal justice. And people would say to me, what are you doing? You're supposed to be locking people up, not letting them out. People would say to me, what are you doing giving jobs to them? Other people need jobs. 
But I said, no, this is about what we need to do to reform a system that is broken. When I think about it going forward, there are so many other things that we need to continue to do. We need sentencing reform. We need to legalize marijuana. We need to, and I will tell you on the legalization of marijuana piece, I'm really clear about this. It has, it has been such a big part, the criminalization of marijuana has been such a big part of what has fueled America's system of mass incarceration. And it's got to end. And so here in Nevada, you know that you passed a law. California, we did the same thing. But we need to have, a, we need to, on a federal level, decriminalize and legalize marijuana. And then my agenda on that doesn't end there. Because I'm also clear that there are thousands of particularly young men, young women also, who have been designated felons for life. And now, because our states have legalized it, it is one of the biggest cash cows as a new industry. People are making so much money off of this. For doing what? Selling weed. <laughs> Meanwhile, these young men and women who are doing the same thing and have been designated felons for life. So part of my agenda is what we need to do in terms of dealing with their convictions and, 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 and expungement and all of that, but also about saying through federal policy that they also need to be first in line for the jobs and the tracks that are about running those businesses. Thank you all, to all of you this year.